This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Part 3. The Dialectic of Egoism 50. The concept of communist society can be arrived at by one pathway through the analysis and development of the self-contradiction of egoism of the self-contradictory structure of the egoistic project. Communist society itself and the self-transcendence of the narrow egoism of privatized man can only be the outcome of the imminent and historical dialectic of egoism itself. 51. The egoistic project, in order to become adequate to itself, must include more than one ego. 52. Communist egoism, likewise communist society, is only the final conclusion of the imminent critique, the self-critique, of bourgeois egoism, of privatized life. 53. Communism is simply incomprehensible to our saint, because the communists do not put egoism against self-sacrifice, or self-sacrifice against egoism, nor do they express this contradiction theoretically, either in its sentimental or in its high-flown ideological form. On the contrary, they demonstrate the material basis engendering it, with which it disappears of itself. The communists do not preach morality at all, such as Stirner preaches so extensively. They do not put to people the moral demand, love one another, do not be egoists, etc. On the contrary, they are well aware that egoism, just as much as self-sacrifice, is, in definite circumstances, a necessary form of the self-assertion of individuals. Hence the communists by no means want, as St. Max believes, and as his loyal Dottore Graziano, Arnold Ruga, repeats after him, to do away with the private individual for the sake of the general, self-sacrificing man. Communist theoreticians, the only ones who have time to devote to the study of history, are distinguished precisely because they alone have discovered that throughout history, the general interest is created by individuals who are defined as private persons. They know that this contradiction is only a seeming one, because one side of it, the so-called general, is constantly being produced by the other side, private interest and by no means opposes the latter as an independent force with an independent history, so that this contradiction is in practice always being destroyed and reproduced. Hence it is not a question of the Hegelian negative unity of two sides of a contradiction, but of the materially determined destruction of the preceding materially determined mode of life of individuals, with the disappearance of which this contradiction, together with its unity, also disappear. 54. The supersession of private egoism follows the same course as private egoism. The path out of narrow egoism is the straight and narrow path of this egoism itself. But as Einstein argued with respect to physical time-space, what is straight and narrow from the narrow viewpoint of the imminent observer may be anything but straight to a larger view, highly curvaceous in fact, even curved back on itself. The abstract negation of egoism repression will not suffice, but only its determinate negation and its imminent negation, that is, auto-negation. 55. The development of egoism, the historical phenomenology of subjectivity, is a dialectic also in this sense. The way out of narrow egoism passes through narrow egoism itself, and all attempts to block this way tend only to inhibit the development and arrest it at this narrow stage. 56. Private egoism is egoism in conflict with its own essence. But this becomes true visibly, and therefore fully, once and only once. The conditions necessitating narrow appropriation, often lumped sloppily under the Confucianist category scarcity, are gone, and the conditions for a fuller, wider appropriation have matured. Specifically, this means the conditions for the appropriation of other people as subjects mutuality, as opposed to merely as objects, exploitation. Thus, for example, the present recession, the growth of poverty and desperation which it entails, has been at first a major setback in this regard, and has drastically curtailed the daily experiential base which for a while, at the peak of the prosperity of the 60s, made this critique feel true. 57. What we tend not to be immediately aware of is that the prevailing narrow and impoverishing form of egoism, 
of self-gratification is one deeply mixed with its opposite, with the renunciation of self-gratification. That the greed we normally experience is a greed radically admixed with its own negation, with the embittered renunciation of greed, basing itself, as it must, on the narrow conditions of self-enjoyment presently available and especially formerly available to it under conditions of extreme deprivation and toil. Specifically, the form of self-enjoyment which is excluded, the secret self-denial hiding at the heart of privatized egoism, is the denial of all the social pleasures, the communal pleasures of spontaneous gregariousness, the warmth of human solidarity, the exuberance of authentic festivity, the pleasures of association and social satisfaction in general. The vestiges of these are confined within the ever-narrowing circle of the private family, itself the nuclear remnant adapted by capital of the bygone primitive communist kinship societies and their extended families, which publicizes its final self-critique in the burgeoning rates of divorce, divorce being recognized as and officially titled estrangement. This especially in the advanced capitalist countries, that is, the countries which have reached the advanced stages of social alienation. The lag in appropriation of the newer conditions of non-scarcity, of potential, and to some extent already actual abundance, is the context in which the present historical stage of the dialectic of egoism must be understood. The positive moment of the early hip movement, of which moment today's professional street vermin and gutter hippies are in no sense the heirs, the whole libidinal emergence which began in the 60s and now in the recession of the 70s is eclipsed again, is comprehensible in part as a beginning of the appropriation of those new conditions. 58. The root illusion of all pious and ascetic ideologies is that since exploitation is the partial appropriation of man by man, the way to rid the world of this sin is in instituting the non-appropriation of man by man rather than the total appropriation. That the way to the negation, quieting of desire is its repression rather than its fulfillment. Touch me not, and I will not touch thee. The logic of privation. The problem of the misery of narrow egoism admits of only two solutions. Either, one, its exaggeration to the point where it overspills its own limits, its expansion until it becomes one with the totality, rediscovering precisely within itself its supposed opposite and that which it formerly excluded. Or two, its repression, and with that evidently the unending reign of the present form, which is all that its historical repression has so far succeeded in producing. 59. Communism is not the self-repression of egoism. It is only when narrow egoism wants to transcend itself for its own deepest reasons, when it finds internal reasons, egoistic reasons, when it sees itself becoming its own ruin, defeating to itself, self-defeating, and therefore self-contradictory, that it brings itself to its own end, and communism begins. Private egoism historically is its own undoing. Its exercise brings about its own socialization, social egoism. Communism is the negation of egoism only by virtue of being a higher form of egoism, egoism's own higher form. Narrow egoism, the ideology of self-gratification and self-realization, and the practice of exclusive self-gratification and self-realization becomes, at a certain stage in its development, a fetter upon self-realization and a fetter upon self-gratification. It becomes the main limit and obstacle to its own goals. It becomes a barrier to itself. This is the self-negativity which awakens in it the desire for its own transcendence, for self-transcendence, a supersession in accord with itself, with its own essence, and on its own terms, basing itself on the possibility of the community of gratification as the unlimited amplification of gratification. This is the imminent self-critique of narrow egoism, the death sentence which it pronounces upon itself. Thus the determinate negation of narrow egoism can only be through its own organic development, its own further development. That is, it can only be self-negation. Happiness at the expense of others, the exclusion of the other's happiness from your own, henceforth appears as a miserable basis, as the opposite of happiness, as misery and private property as a wealth of poverty, compared to the new basis which has grown up secretly with modern society itself.
Communism is the comprehension of exclusive egoism as historically self-contradictory and thus finite, doomed to perish, as not eternal human nature, but on the contrary, self-canceling, transitory, transitional, as the decidedly unnatural, antisocial condition of man prior to the historical self-completion of the human species. Communism is the comprehension of bourgeois egoism as already containing and implying its own historical negation, as containing its own negation in embryo, containing the seeds of its own destruction by virtue of its being false to itself. Society, socialism, and social production was its repressed essence all along. 60. All along the line, consciously or not, me first, has always been the necessary pattern of everyone's practice. Everyone at every moment of their lives, consciously or not, acts in his own self-interest at some level. Anything else would be inconceivable, impossible. Unable to pursue his desires directly, a masochist uses the mediation of pain. The masochists of morality, ideology, and causes seek pleasure by means of the pain of subordinating themselves through these projections. The moral idealist attempts to get what he wants through the mediation of his projected ideal because he doesn't know how to get what he wants directly. He doesn't know the practical means within himself as the subject and center of that practice. So he posits his center outside of himself as a rigidified generalization which is to decide for him. In so doing, he makes the mistake of thinking that consistency with his ideal is always consistency with his self-interest. 61. Communist egoism names the negation of the negation of primitive egoism, narrow egoism. But the aspect of the process as an imminent or self-critique, and never an external or mechanical negation, e.g. the smash-self ideology of Maoism, must above all be emphasized against all coercive and bureaucratic methods. Socialized egoism, communist egoism, is the negation of the negation of capitalist egoism, but it is the self-negation of the self-negation of that egoism. This second negation is essential to narrow egoism itself, no less than the first negation, which produces its antithesis, moralism, anti-egoism, altruism. This second negation is necessary to narrow egoism, to the preservation of its own premises, once it advances to a certain threshold in its self-development. The proper method to catalyze to stimulate and accelerate this process in another, i.e. from the outside, is the evocative method, the method of seduction. The method of rebuke, though useful at certain crucial turns here too, is, especially in the form of the method of chastisement, more adequate to the first, not the second, negation of narrow egoism. The method of chastisement is that of forcibly drawing out moral projections from the psyche, of creating handles in the victim's head for easy manipulation, handling, by authorities of ideologues of all sorts, of instilling submissiveness, of inducing the split in the victim between the sense of duty and the sense of inclination, of forming the guilt loop of alienated self-control. The second negation means, on the contrary, the negation of altruism, the overcoming of all these separations, the collapse of the projections back into the psyche, their reowning in the coalescence of the self, the centration instead of the alienation of self-control. This is the very formation of the self capable of self-management. 62. Don't get us wrong. Make no mistake. This theory is no apologia for narrow egoism. We have no interest in that negation of altruism, which is simply a return to narrow egoism, a regression. Communist egoism, and not altruism, is the true opposite of narrow egoism. Communist egoism and not narrow egoism is the true opposite of altruism. Although altruism and narrow egoism are commonly taken as true opposites, they have this in common. An imminent critique of either must arrive at communist egoism. That is, communist egoism is the synthesis of altruism and narrow egoism. Communist egoism is simultaneously, identically both of them and neither. It is that unitary rejection of both which is also their unitary affirmation. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.